In this video, we'll look at strain hardening in metals. Strain hardening is a result from dislocation-dislocation interaction, as well as dislocation rearrangement as strain increases. Before considering strain hardening, let's start by looking at the initial dislocation densities in metals. For the well-annealed samples, usually the dislocation density ranges from 10 to the power of 7 to 10 to the power of 9 per meter square. For heavily deformed samples, the dislocation density usually ranges from 10 to the 13th to 10 to the 14th per meter square. There are a couple of notes I like to make here. When we compare the dislocation densities, we usually don't care about the exact numbers. What we worry about are the orders of magnitudes. For example, 10 to the 7 versus 10 to the 13. Second, let's look at the unit of dislocation density. The unit is per meter square. The reason is because dislocation density is dislocation length divided by volume. The length unit is meter. The volume unit is meter cube. Meter over meter cube gives us per meter square. Next, let's look at the deformation behavior of single crystals, especially those aligned to encourage single slip. Here is the shear stress versus shear strain plot. The initial part is linear elastic. Further straining the sample will activate dislocations, and we enter plastic regime. At the transition of elastic deformation and the plastic deformation, we can easily identify the CISS. As you further strain the specimen, you will see the first dramatic change in the strain hardening rate. And as the deformation proceeds, you will see another change. Depends on the strain hardening rate, the plastic regime can be divided into three stages. These are called stage 1, stage 2, and stage 3. The question is, what kind of dislocation behavior lead to these three distinct stages? For stage 1, as you can see, the strain hardening is fairly low. In this stage, dislocations can easily glide and multiply in the crystal without too much interactions. That's why we don't get too much strain hardening in this stage. In stage 2, there is a dramatic increase in the strain hardening rate indicated by a rapid increase in stress at given strain. At this stage, dislocations start to interact with each other to form dislocation entanglements. One example is something we have already covered in one of the previous videos, the cotroloma locks. In the cotroloma locks, we start by two sessile dislocations gliding on two different planes, then they meet at one point and form a sessile lock. These cotroloma locks can behave as dislocation barriers for dislocation glide, leading to the strong strain hardening. With further plastic deformation, we'll enter stage 3. We have learned that when the dislocation density in the material is extremely high, such a configuration is not thermodynamically stable. Any thermal perturbation, even something like room temperature, can help dislocations to rearrange to reduce the overall strain energy. The result is something we call dynamic recovery. At the microstructure and the dislocation level, what's going to happen is those dislocations will rearrange themselves to form subgrain boundaries or dislocation arrays. In this stage, the strain hardening rate will decrease again. Here are two examples showing the dynamically recovered microstructure in aluminum and copper aluminum alloy. In both cases, the dislocations rearranged themselves to form cell boundaries, and within each cell, there's nearly no dislocations. One interesting observation to make is that the cell boundaries in aluminum seems to be sharper than the ones in the copper alloy. This difference is caused by the stacking fault energy. In aluminum, the stacking fault energy is high, which tends to give sharp dislocation walls moving away from the single crystal deformation behavior to polycrystals. 
the polycrystal strain hardening behavior is something we are more familiar with. We start with the linear elastic deformation followed by the plastic regime. In this case, we do not have three stages of strain hardening. This is because the grain boundaries can interact with dislocations. At the very early stage of deformation, there is nearly no easy glide and the deformation and hardening are governed by dislocation grain boundary and the dislocation dislocation interactions. The last thing I'd like to quickly discuss here is how can we quantify the effect of dislocation density on the strength of the material. In grain boundary hardening, we have the whole patch relationship. In strain hardening, we have something similar. Delta tau is proportional to GB square root rho. Here, delta tau is the increase in shear stress due to the contribution from dislocation density. And rho here is simply dislocation density. As plastic deformation proceeds, rho increases, then delta tau increases. I have a question for you at the end of the video. For this equation here, do you apply that to explain the strain hardening in silver crystals, or you use that to explain the strain hardening in polycrystals? Why and why not? I'll leave the answer in the comment. In the next video, we'll move to the third hardening mechanism, solid solution hardening.